it's not like they're criminals being arrested, you know? And even yeah. if they were, you're still, you're still able to have access to some type of dignity. And you have to put things in perspective of, is this actually making society worse? Why are we as citizens not able to hold these bad cops accountable? And it's because of this. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Social Discord, episode 23, Good Cop, Bad Cop, Part 2, Why We Gave Police Their Power, A History Lesson. I'm Dalen Turk. I'm Kara Tebow. And I'm Curtis Medina. Curtis, I see you laughing. Did I do it out of order or something? <laughs> no, there was, there, was, there was just a pause right before Kara said, <laughs> because... said her name. <laughs> I just went to a different planet for a second. I'm back. I'm back. All right, folks. We are here for part two of Good Cop, Bad Cop. We are ready to dive in. Uh, we left off in the first episode with uh, the uh, Nixon's war on drugs taking their first victims. So, Curtis, why don't you uh, take us away? Yeah. So, okay. So we are back to uh, the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Uh, candidate Nixon, uh, he seized on the association between race and the rise in crime uh, to win that election. Uh, this was um, after some really high profile um, kind of scary moments in American history, some shootings, um, and, uh, and middle America was ready to believe that total anarchy was just around the corner and every single community in America especially theirs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, and this was at a time that to happen. This was at a time when 56% of Americans supported using police to crack down on protests, which obviously it's the 60s protests have been going on for the past decade. And then another interesting one is 66% thought police should get more power. So on yeah, top of everything they've done, 66% of Americans thought it wasn't enough. This, this is a generational shift, just like what's happening right now in America. You know, you have you have the greatest generation aging out. You at the time you had baby boomers coming up, you know, thinking differently about things like drugs, about war, about race, making real social change, just like it is today. Uh, you know, the baby boomers are now on the other end of 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 that argument they're very resistant some are very resistant to you know to to different types of change different types of um you know uh, the race debate things like that um so so just like today they they were fighting for a lot of a lot of new rights and at this and and the people who were against it and making and getting a lot of power by resisting that change uh were the republicans um nixon was the kind of a perfect example of an old school Republican that uh, was was pretty boring to a lot of younger people, but but was a very safe uh, choice for a lot of middle aged older Americans. That's why he lost uh, to that hot young hip, Mister JFK. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone brings that up, but you know, but and that's true. It's very true that side by side with him, he had, he didn't have a chance, but. He did come back, and, and that is one of the greatest comebacks in history. Most people would have just mm -hmm. given up and said, the younger generation has it. He said, uh-uh, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to double down on my Nixonism. Well, and Nixon was, <laughs> Nixon was a much better politician. You know, it's, the whole thing is, if it was on radio, Nixon would have swept the floor with JFK in that right. first election. You know, and, that it, was, and that was the first televised um, debate yeah. ever. And so so it, that, well, it, they weren't ready for it. Nixon also realized that like he wasn't popular with people very much and literally like went to like acting coaches. And did he really? Actions, yeah, he did. He Interesting. essentially went to acting coaches to go basically learn how to be more likable on TV. Wow. I didn't um, know that. If you're a genius, now we just have to make people not hate you. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I would have thought Nixon would have been too arrogant to do something like that. Well, I think he was, I think that, uh, the pride motivated. in losing was, more, yeah. you know, that make okay. That's fair. That's fair. He was yeah. very motivated to yeah. win. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, Watergate. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, yeah, very motivated to win. So yeah, you know, and so it, you know, a movie I can recommend, I'm a big movie fan. Uh, there's this movie that came out last year. It was nominated for best picture. 
kind of got washed over by uh, other movies that were also yeah. really good, but you should definitely check it out. It's called The Trial of Chicago oh. 7, um, Aaron Sorkin film. And it is actually about this exact yep. uh, time period because uh, police were, were starting to crack down on on uh, protesters and hippies and all these people who were considered to be undesirable. Um, and a large part of America was totally okay with that violence if it, as long as it was against these new young, you know, troublemakers. Well, and, and we see this was a, a instance where we saw police just indiscriminately attacking protesters and attacking people that it was totally unwarranted, but because there was this vision in so many eyes of Americans that it was crimes, it was violence, it was drugs, it was all justified. And we'll see mm -hmm. that as we go through this, that so many of these actions were considered justifiable in the eyes of the courts. And you see these terms being repeated over and over again throughout history. Nixon called his people the ignored America. And years later, Reagan called them the silent majority. And then Trump called them the forgotten American. Okay. You know, like like they are just copying one after another. Let's take a poll here. Which one of those three is your favorites? <laughs> I silent majority. I was going to say that's silent nice. majority is definitely the best one. Like, let's be real. <laughs> because that one is both strong and scary. You like, mm -hmm. like somebody lurking behind that silently, but they are also like, there's also more of them. So they're going to like overpower yeah. you. Like whether you're they're right or wrong. Like they're just going to like take like, over America. That's really creepy. To me. Ignored America makes it sound like someone was just shoved in a corner and like, ah, we'll, we'll <laughs> deal with you later. But silent majority it's is like, how Nixon felt. <laughs> <laughs> he, he needed a new marketing uh, leader there. So they start. Okay. So they started making laws um, left and right to, to empower police to, to, uh, to take down this threat. Um, that they that they felt um, and and uh, to s start the war on drugs to try to eradicate drugs off the street to try to you know really push back hard on crime um, and there's a really great quote from this from the book that that we're referencing here a lot the rise of the warrior cop um, where where they quote uh, Senate Ma Majority Leader Mike Mansfield which was the highest ranking member of the Senate after the Vice President. And he said that at one point he was so overwhelmed by the amount of laws that they were that were putting forward that he just gave up trying to figure out if the laws he was voting on were constitutional. He said he just voted for them all and he let the court sort them out. <laughs> That's so horrifying. <laughs> That's the that I, I call that when you throw things against a wall and see what sticks mm -hmm. like <laughs> strategy. And that, that's not good governance. Well, and the, the sad thing is, I feel like there's a lot of a lot of politicians that do exactly that. Which mm -hmm. is so lame because like your constituents are voting for you because you assumingly have like very certain beliefs. And if you're just going to vote for everything, it's like, well, you don't right. stand for anything. Well, and then in recent... Oh, go ahead. No, go. I was just no. Go ahead. You're fine. <laughs> I was gonna go <laughs> off on a tangent. <laughs> I was gonna say in in recent years, um, I'm really glad that we're actually kind of re-examining the Black Panthers because mm -hmm. while they they were a really, I, I don't want to say they were necessarily like like a good organization for America, but but I think they were needed. Like they weren't they weren't evil people that that they were depicted in in a lot of the the news that you saw at the time they had they had a lot of reasons to be doing what they were doing and they had been pushed around by the cops so much that when they started you know like visibly holding guns and 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 guarding their own neighborhoods against some of this oppression like you can't blame them for that and uh, and uh, there was another really great movie that was also nominated for Best Picture um, last year um, that uh, called Judas and the Black Messiah, which mm -hmm. talks a lot about this. Um, and uh, it's basically uh, SWAT raids started around this time. And one of the main organizations that they wanted to completely squash was the Black Panthers. They saw them as a as like a rising militia mm -hmm. and they didn't see their reasoning for for 
for what they were asking for. Well, and, um, and J. Edgar Hoover took a personal vendetta against the Black Panthers. Although, you know, there there were instances, of course, as we all know, like J. Edgar Hoover was a man who took things incredibly personally. Um, and I think that's mm-hmm. due to personal traumas within his life. As If anyone knows J. Edgar Hoover, he uh, had a lot of personal issues. And so, especially within the uh, creation of the FBI, he took a lot of things personally. And this was an instance where it became a, a goal for him to shut down the Black Panther Party. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we also see Daryl Gates getting brought into the, the mix here of, of the LAPD. Um, so it, this is an interesting story that um, at the time, uh, Gates was just starting to get the SWAT teams going and was, and was trying to be really careful so that it wouldn't be shut down. Um, so he actually decided to ask for permission um, from the mayor uh, who actually had to call Washington to get permission even higher to use a grenade launcher. <laughs> a grenade launcher. <laughs> a gr- one grenade launcher. But like, so it needed that amount of permission to do that because it was such a crazy idea for the time. And one of the things that, that the book points out, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, um, was that Nowadays, there's no permission asked Mm -hmm. to use things like that. They have them already in the police departments. They can use them pretty much at their discretion. And and, And, uh, and they're given a a big leeway for this. And it's not, like I will say, they're not shooting off grenades. Like they're, they're used for tear gas canisters and such things as that. So they're not just launching grenades blindly at people. Um, although I guess I, 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 I don't know of any instances where that was, so may, maybe it has happened, but um, I, I feel like that would be known if they launched grenades <laughs> at the Black Panther Party. I mean, I, I believe it, ha- I, 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 if I remember right, I didn't write it down here, but if I remember, if I remember right, I think Washington said no when they yeah. asked about this. So they actually did not use it in this okay. case, if I remember right. Um but uh, but it was actually kind of a botched fa- a, a, a failure of a of a raid uh, at the time, and it was really highly um, covered by the news because they thought it was going to be a really big thing for them. Um, but it actually kind of made them look like idiots. Um, they, they 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 did end up arresting um, some Black Panthers, and but in this raid, the Black Panthers shot um, several of the cops, and. And they went on trial for it and actually were able to use the defense um, that they didn't know they were cops and that they were shooting intruders um, because there was some disagreement about whether or not they said who they were. They looked Mm -hmm. like they were like a military force, like like attacking them because they didn't look like cops. This is a whole new thing for the time. Um, So I guess they actually did get acquitted. Yeah. um, But this is a defense that never works now like now it's like they got away with it because it was one of the first times it happened but when people try to use this now it's it's a a no-go well it's it's one of those things and we'll see it as we go through this episode where and curtis you mentioned it before we started recording of it's cause and effect something happens and they're like okay we need to figure out a loophole to get around this or create a law or something to get around this and that's what they do from time and time and time again. So we have to go back in time just a little bit. Like, so I have to explain something. Uh, so, so that there was this thing called the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1913. Um, it gave the federal government the authority to regulate illicit drugs um, that had, but up to that point, it had mostly been limited to the power just to tax them. Um, so they used this, this as a precursor and in 1969, um, the Supreme Court struck down the Marijuana Tax Act, uh, which was a case involving a counterculture icon named Timothy Leary, which I actually had heard before. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think I heard him in a folk song or something. I don't know what. Like, <laughs> like a <laughs> Willie Nelson song or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so so there was a, a, a new bill. Uh, it was, uh, I don't have the guy's name right in front of me, but his last name was Dodd. Um, and it took this new strategy that instead of, prohibiting illicit drugs by taxing them because that wasn't going to work anymore. Um, Dodd's bill gave the Justice Department a wide range of new powers that they could directly enforce federal drug prohibition under the authority of the Constitution's 
commerce clause. You guys remember what, when we talked about the the commerce clause before? Refresh mm -hmm. my memory. Okay, so this is this is a really interesting law that has been like a part of 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 a lot of different changes in America. So we last talked about it when we were talking about the Civil Rights Act because it was the reason that we were able to desegregate private businesses because the idea was right. that if if products cross state lines um it is now federal jurisdiction and mm -hmm. the states can't just decide that's right it's okay or the private person can't just decide it's okay so they used it again for this purpose saying that the federal government had the right to uh to control drugs that they didn't like um under this same law because it affected multiple states and it was crossing borders it's it's interesting how it, like you can use one um like one act to do a wide swath of things and you can manipulate the wording and what it does to basically just do what you want it to do i mean i think this one might be the the most elastic of all <laughs> like acts you know i mean it, it has really been used quite a few times for a, a wide variety of purposes some good some not so good um, so under under the 1970 federal crime bill that they came out with, um, the annual budget for federal funds to police precincts went from $75 million to $500 million. Jeez. That's massive. <laughs> quite, a, quite a leap there. I mean, and this goes back to what Nixon was saying um, in, in that speech where he said, we will give any amount of money. Like, I've never heard a Republican say that except for maybe like, like, maybe the war with the rock or something. Yeah. yeah like, like he basically said, you need more money for this. We will give you more money. And, uh, and, and they did. And ever since then, the amount of money that the federal government gives to police has been growing every single time. And I'm talking Democrats, I'm talking Republicans, I'm talking the people who are in power now. Um, the most money I believe that was given to police was through in the Obama administration. So, you know, anyone who's anti-Democrat for, you know, Blue lives not mattering to them or whatever, like you're kind of full of crap because they mm -hmm. have given a ton of money and support to police, um, maybe too much, and and definitely without asking a ton of questions, which they should definitely have done. Right. Well, I think um, we see it in the later 80s as well as another instance of Joe Biden working on the side of police to get them more money. Absolutely. And 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 there was no like it wasn't like there was never a time where they were like, tell us what you need and we will like, we'll consider it. It was like, here's money, do stuff with it. Like we're just yeah. going to throw money at this problem. There was a quote from that rise of the warrior cop book um, from a former police officer. I think his name was Santarelli where he said they didn't value education or training. They valued hardware. Uh, the city of Birmingham asked for armored personnel carrier. Uh, other police chiefs wanted tanks. Los Angeles asked for a submarine. <laughs> for what? I don't know. <laughs> I, I do. I do understand. I don't like, think they knew. Like, a, a, but like, what a, is your police? Like, your police force is not the navy. Yeah, right. right. You need a submarine. I will it say was no. One of those, like, you gotta ask. You gotta ask first, and like, worry about yeah. the consequences later. I guess. I think there are certain. Uh, like police forces where a submarine or at least nowadays with the way submarines are now where you can get like the two man subs for like, you know, di like ship wreckage help, whatever it may so be. They just, they just wanted the Disneyland sub. Like yeah. they just wanted like, like the one that like, like they could just like I go just, like five feet in the water. I feel like in 1970, <laughs> the only subs were like attack military subs or like scouting submarines. Like I can't like, for some very specific military esque reasons, police wanted it just in case, but they really wanted it to create fear in the hearts of criminals. Um, they felt that, like, if they had this ready, just by having it, no one would dare do whatever they were going to do. Like, right. you know, whatever unimaginable thing somebody might do that a submarine would help, you know, stop. Uh, it would stop them from even thinking about it. I, you know, we have to look back to what we talked about in the beginning of this series of the idea of the thin blue line, us and them. 
is they're looking at the criminals, everyone they consider criminals on one side, and they want them to look back at their side of the line and see terror. Like, they do not want to mess with that. Absolutely. And at the same time, there was there was this alternate way that some uh, police chiefs were were handling this they they you know of course they wanted more money every you know if you care about your department you want more money but but some police chiefs like uh the head of the dc police which is jerry wilson at the time uh you know he had a different approach so he so he did hire a thousand additional police officers uh using nixon's crime bill money but he instructed the officers to actually avoid violence and he even um, told them not to stand in front of protesters in riot gear and looking all tough and everything. Instead, he instructed them to park nearby a protest in a bus just in case mm-hmm. they were needed. So, so he was he was a kind of an interesting mix of of these ideologies where he felt like it was needed, perhaps, but that he also worried that their presence created the chaos, mm-hmm. didn't prevent, not prevented it. Um, well, and, and that's uh, and- that's something I witnessed firsthand at the Black Lives Matter protest back in 2019 here in Austin. Was and and I saw police officers doing there. It was an interesting mix because there were some police officers who tried to talk with the protesters and they communicated and they weren't trying to be intimidating. And but then there were some that I saw were they were egging it on. They were trying to mm-hmm. start it. And you know, I'm not saying it was every, but I saw it happen. You know, and I think just their presence there, it's it's the idea of Newton's law with every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? And I think that goes yeah. beyond physics in the sense that if there is a presence there that is opposing your protest, opposing, opposing your movement, there will be a reaction to that. Dalen, it seems like when we talked after that protest... And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like you were a little bit shook by what you saw because, um, I, I mean, we've never really seen that reaction from police with our own eyes before, right? Like, we know it, we hear about it, but, like, you witnessed it, like you just mm-hmm. said. And did that kind of, like, change your perception of police maybe a little bit more? I mean, it, it, it did in the sense that, you know, like I like I said, I... I know a lot of people who are police officers. I've, I've worked right alongside a lot of police officers in my time working um, in athletics operations. My father-in-law is a sheriff's deputy. But it, it was the first time where, you know, I see on the news these things happening. But it was my first time witnessing bad cops. It was my first time witnessing firsthand malpractice. It was I, I was shoot, I was photographing um, cops and they were lined along the interstate and we were on the like the grass embankment going down to the frontage road, and on the opposite side of the frontage road, there was these apartment complexes, and there were some people just sitting on the grass below the apartments, just watching. And I I saw police officers just completely without any hesitation, without any war, any justification, aim their shotguns and just start shooting those people. Who were just sitting there doing nothing, and was they it with rubber bullets. I it guess. was it was with rubber bullets and bean bags, and they just would aim up and just shoot at people. Were they shooting them correctly? I, I from what I understand, with rubber bullets, you're supposed to like hit the ground and like, and it's supposed to bounce and hit them. That you're not actually supposed to hit the person directly. No, not not really, because um, the whole point is that it's it's non lethal. But no, but, they it, don't, but the people don't know that necessarily. Like, no, I, like if somebody points a gun at you, you don't know. You're hoping that it's a, a rubber bullet, you know. Well, and I've seen because they have like different ones, and like they have the ones where it shoots out of basically looks like a, a single shell or a single barrel grenade launcher, and it shoots this rubber bullet that's like the size of a golf ball. It's usually oh, wow. like you know I saw someone five feet away from me get shot in the temple, and he got sent Jeez. to the hospital. You know, I I saw um, um, someone get maced right in the face, like at point blank, um, and they weren't even they didn't touch the police officers. They didn't do anything. Um, you know, I think yeah. that the police officers, I think the idea of having them in the gear and and and, you know, stand there looking tough and all that is supposed to show like a strength of 
of law and order or, you know, of the city or whatever. But I think a lot of times it actually has an, an opposite effect that it, it can legitimize, first of all, if somebody's there, you know, protesting, they might just give up and go home. But if there's a line of cops, you know, giving them, you know, reason to stay, they might stay longer, they might yell louder, that might turn in, turn violent. Um, and especially if the protest is about cops, like if they're protesting cops, not just the cops are there at the protest, but they're actually protesting cops, like that, I feel like that just gets multiplied in mm -hmm. everything that the police do is now under even more scrutiny because they are not a welcomed force in this situation from the protesters there they can all they can do is sort of make it worse like unless somebody is actually actively breaking something or like something that's arrestable mm -hmm. i don't really know what purpose the cops have for being there especially like that like in military yeah. gear and with guns yeah. pointing well, at people and and in this instance it was at the front steps of um APD headquarters you know the the protesters took over the interstate right in downtown Austin um and so it like from the get go it was it, it was very intense from the start um but i i do want to point out too that you know, I, I'm a supporter of Black Lives Matter. I've, you know, obviously, I'm a supporter of civil rights and everything. But some of the stuff, I, you know, I was right there on the front step at the start of it at the barrier that the police had at the top of the stairs going to APD headquarters and the protesters. And I, I was baffled for a moment there, too, because I would listen to the protesters and the things that they would yell at the police officers and things that they would do. And it seemed to me, and I think I've seen this a lot and a lot of people point it out is, is these, a lot of the protests turn away from the actual point. And so that was something that baffled me as well. Witnessing it firsthand so you, was they were yelling slurs. It's just all sorts of just saying? horrific yeah. things and personal things at specific officers where I'm yeah. just like, what like what does that do to help the cause what are you doing right now that is fighting for civil rights it, it was something that really confused me as to what mindset do you have that right now at this moment you are helping fight for civil rights i mean right? they're just losing their minds and, because and that's what it was not been able to to you know that maybe they felt oppressed in their life and they're using this as a way to vent but that's mm -hmm. not the right place to do it right yeah. Um, but just it, witnessing it firsthand, both from the protest protesters' perspective and the police officers' perspective, it was it was very eye opening. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and Jerry Wilson, you know, he he he. I think he kind of sensed that's where the things were going. Um, a lot at the time, a lot of people really criticized the fact that he wasn't willing to put those police officers out there. Um, and when he was criticized uh, for for quote, not standing behind his men. It was a great, great quote that he had. He said, I don't stand behind my men. I stand in front of them because he was the type of person that if he was going to send people in riot gear into a situation, he wanted to be at the front. He wasn't somebody that just sent his minions out. Right. That is my type of leader. Like, yeah, that's, absolutely. That is 100% the leadership that I follow. He refused to do no knock raids, which was which was uh, something that was very new at the time. We're going to talk about it in a future episode more, but uh, you know he refused to do that, thinking that it it did more uh, harm than good. And uh, and one of the things I really loved is that he actually used some of the money to do, as the book described, mundane tactics like increasing money to methadone clinics and <laughs> improve and improving street lighting, which I mean the basic just improving street lighting yeah. can save lives. Yeah, no, that's really, a, truly that's brilliant. Like you, you think of the the case of especially in the '60s and '70s where murder was rampant, serial killers were going crazy, and you know you think of all these innocent women that mm -hmm. get assaulted and murdered and kidnapped and whatever it may be, and something as simple as extra lighting can save lives. 
it just it just takes the whole idea out of the criminal's mind that they're gonna get away with it and uh and you know i mean now you know there's also cameras things like that that has also helped but yeah but just as something as simple as as just a light actually one of the things that that i really like a trend in cities is that they're moving toward um uh more like daylight balanced lights like the cooler white lights because they're using the uh um oh my god i'm blanking out on what they're what's what's the new light type of lights called i should know this like led <laughs> led there you go <laughs> technology i should know this i work on movies <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, LED, yeah, they, you know, they use like LED lights because, you know, it saves energy and money and all that, but it also has a much more relaxed, cooler, clearer, um, brighter look to it. So they're taking out all those gross yellow, like orangey lights that you see in a lot of really bad neighborhoods. And they're putting nice, pleasant lights that, that actually has an effect on you that makes you feel happier. Mm-hmm. because that's hmm. what daylight does right interesting i find yeah, this so during this um okay. real, I, just, I find this whole um like jerry wilson thing ironic right you you talk about republican versus democrat big government small government and i feel like what jerry wilson is doing is exactly what democrats have been asking for but it, it sounds like what republicans want is they just want police on every street corner monitoring everywhere stopping crime but is that also not like interjecting into personal liberty like it it, it all seems so kind of backwards it's, it's and ironic a, it's a macho thing it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a i think it's kind of a male driven macho thing that yeah. you hear a lot in conservatism that there's not enough fighting in the war on drugs right did you guys hear what's happening in uh, buckhead uh no. buckhead Georgia? So Buckhead is a very, 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 very wealthy, well-to-do suburb of Atlanta. Mm. Um, okay. And like just very CEOs, you know, whatever. I can't, you know, you get the gist. Beverly Hills of Georgia. Um, well, they they just came out today, I think. They're trying to divorce Atlanta um, because they said that they're so <laughs> sick of, they're so sick of the lack of police presence that they are currently trying to remove themselves from the Atlanta police force, get their own Buckhead police force, Buckhead dispatch center. Wow. So that they can quote unquote, uh, something like pummel crime or get hard on crime. So the police can do what they're supposed to do. Take a bite out of crime. That's wow. right. <laughs> and before we move on to the next part, I think these, these stats here are really important because I think it paints a huge picture as to what was going on. So under Jerry Wilson, violent crime in D.C. dropped 25% and property crime dropped 28%. Now you compare this to Nixon's national efforts, violent crime under Nixon's efforts dropped, or they went up, sorry, they went up, my correction, they went up 40% nationwide and property crime rose 24% nationwide. But yeah, this, so in fixing the problem, they, they exacerbated it. Yeah, like hysteria just took over um but with that uh let's move on to the uh kind of where we left the war off on drugs the war yeah. on drugs takes its first victims okay so there was a uh an organization that was started through the government um odale which <laughs> stood for the office of Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement. I'm sorry, but that's <laughs> Odale. Like, that's just... It's Odale. So I, I feel you like you can't the, help but say it with a open. southern accent. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, Odale. Odale. <laughs> so what was Odale? Like, what? what's their story? What happened? Where are they coming yeah. to play? Um, okay. Yeah. So, in, uh, so yeah, Odale was around, uh, in, in, and they started doing uh, these raids. And this was kind of the Wild West again. Um, America basically took a page right out of Francis Ford Coppola and Apocalypse Now!, and uh and and they just decided that drugs were the absolute devil and they were going to do anything and everything to to destroy the drugs arrest or kill the people uh even if they were non-violent like literal hippies just hanging out on a farm that Mm -hmm. so so the the craziest one um i do want to we're gonna i want to go back to another one in a second but the craziest one in 1972 a raid was done in humboldt um, by by the police 
involved 19 officers and at least one helicopter. Um, they attempted to raid a suspected drug lab. So they, they heard it was a drug lab through an informant. By the way, for some reason in the 70s, informants were just really like wrong a lot. They just kind of <laughs> took their word for it. And they did all this stuff and like, and they were wrong, like that's like 50% of the time or something. And yet they kept like using the same people. Well, but because they didn't have to be right. Every, right. They, there was nothing in the law that said that if everything was justified, somebody broke, broke into somebody's uh, you know place. If you wrecked a place, it was all being done in the name of, of, of goodness. Right. Yeah. So, so it was, everything was fine. Ends justify the means. Exactly. Uh, so they actually, they, so they thought it was a drug lab, but what it ended up being um, was a hippie couple and their small bags of weed and LSD. Um, they shot the, the man, an unarmed white man, in the back as he ran. Um, I believe it was from the helicopter. I, I could be wrong about oh that part. Oh, my God. That is too but, much. Yeah. And, and these people, you, know, you also have to like understand, too, that that from the perspective of the people, this looked like an invasion from a, like a foreign element. Like these were helicopters coming down, people literally, uh, you know, coming down on ropes from the helicopter Jeez. armed with, but you know, the, it's these tactical, these, like it's, mil it's yeah. absolutely like a tactical military. I mean, operation. from their perspective, they were being invaded by, I don't know who, you know, Canada or something. I don't, you know, I mean, you know, based on, you know, the looks of the people or whatever, the, the, there was, there was no way they could have known the government was going to go this far to try, to try to get their, their bag of weed. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so, so they shot him, killed him, um, never identifying themselves as the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, by and the so way, after the people were arrested, the officer Clifton, he saw um, another agent limping and assumed that that officer had been shot. And so he shot to kill the man who was running away because he saw another officer limp. Right. And there was no coordination, basically, you know, so like mm -hmm. they, they used things like smoke bombs and stuff like that. And so, you know, there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of of people not knowing what was really going on. So, you know, so it may have been, I guess, kind of justified that he thought that the guy was shooting at the cop or something, but, and, and these things do happen, but they shouldn't happen at all because they shouldn't happen to begin mm -hmm. with, not for this, uh, you know? And, and so, yeah, the, uh, a, a photographer, they actually brought yeah. a photographer with them because they thought this was going to be the coolest dang thing ever. This is how confident they were. Like they were ready to show off this is what we're doing to stop drugs. And the photographer took a picture of the man dead on the ground um in a very unnatural pose that you would only really have if you were a corpse. Um and this picture became somewhat famous across the nation in newspapers even uh Rolling Stone actually used an animated version of it um, for their cover because they were so shocked by this and they that by this this rise in authoritarianism um, that they want they they wanted everyone to know like mm -hmm. this that the, how far this had gotten if this could happen in Humboldt <laughs> like this could happen anywhere <laughs> you know and and um, and I believe the uh, was this the one that the that the the officer had already been like like a known person for? for yeah, like, so it looks like he um, roughing up people. Um, yeah, so he had already um, like beaten up some suspects previously, um, and the um, he didn't get any um, suspect. He was just reprimanded. There was no other accountability. Just like the cops in all the movies and the TV shows, right? Later on, right? It's it's the cops that like you know they're, they're the hard boiled cops. They don't they don't care about Miranda rights and they don't care about the red tape. They if they need to ask the subject a subject question, mm -hmm. they do it with their fists. Like this is the ideology that a lot of people look up to, including a lot of police of being of being the way to do things. But mm -hmm. when it happens in real life, these guys are not helpful in the situation. Yeah. They get other officers killed as well as as innocent people and bystanders trying to do do their job and you know it's not his fault that the information was bad from the informant that there wasn't really a drug ring or whatever but it was their fault that they went in with that amount of force seeing a hippie running and thinking oh this is a good idea um, you know let's shoot them 
Well, and so we we're talking about accountability. And so a district attorney did go in and do an investigation and they on the scene, they found he went to try and basically recreate what happened. Um, uh, basically, Willem Dafoe and Boondock Saints. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like exactly the same thing. And uh, he found a tent that was made to look like a drug lab. But what's important to point out is t- there were searches done two days previous and that tent was not there. So it, it made the district attorney believe that it was planted to make it seem as though there was actually a drug lab. Um, to justify after the fact. Exactly. Of, that, of why they shot and did all these crazy things. And so um, the district attorney went after Clifton um, and he indicted him on second degree murder. Um, it was the first time a charge had been brought against a federal narcotics agent, which is very important to point out. This is a key moment. However, it culminated to nothing because Nixon's, uh, he appointed a federal prosecutor who took the case into federal court and all charges were dismissed on what? Justifiable homicide. It all starts with Nixon. <laughs> all right. Everything. Always. All leads and back to We're going to see this a lot. We're going to see this term a lot moving forward. Justifiable homicide. That's We're going to see it in case after case after case. You know, and it gets so misused. I know we're going to talk about it more later, but I, I do just want to say, like, like there is a place in the law for justifiable homicide because yes. if somebody, if somebody is trying to kill you, you know, you have to kill them, and there is protection in the law that says you have the right to do that. So there is justified homicides. However, just because you're a cop does not give you the justification automatically to kill someone. Mm -hmm. There has to be other circumstances. Right, because you're not the judge and jury. No. And so the quote in the book about this, I thought would just just to kind of sum this little part of the story up, said, in the end, a 24-year-old man was chased from his own home by armed men who had just emerged from an army helicopter. They shot him dead in the back while he was unarmed on his own property. The heavy-handed raid was based on false pretenses that didn't turn up criminal a criminal enterprise that it was supposed to find, and no one was ever held accountable for it. Dirk Dickinson, which was the person killed, was collateral damage. And the first of hundreds of people who have been killed for stupid reasons or were completely innocent. Even like that's even worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's all kinds of raids that have happened over the decades that that you know people have died because it was the wrong address. Like they right. they were supposed to be in the neighbor's house, but be, and they killed them, and it was justified as a justifiable homicide. That's not justifiable, right? It's just it it's so crazy. And Curtis and I were talking about this and uh, before we started of. You watch the timeline of how just it gets more and more lax. It gets more and more like, well, we're going to allow this and allow this and allow this. And I think this is a point in the early 70s where it really starts to take off. That snowball really starts to get rolling in that sense. And I want to mention this other this other story, even though it's really not that important to history. But to me as a filmmaker this i saw this in my mind um and it it really like it totally just wrenched my heart so in 1971 also in humboldt two cops spent days on a stakeout watching a single pot plant that was growing along a river so one day a man came up to it and was starting to admire it the police officer confronted him mistook a twig he was holding for a gun, killed him. Turns out these two men had known each other their whole life. Wow. And the man who was admiring the pot plant, he wasn't the grower. He was a friend of the grower. The friend had told him this pot plant was out there. He just came out there to look at a plant. Mm-hmm. And he was killed by an officer <laughs> Who was wasting their time for days watching it. Right. That's that's exactly right. Wasting their time. If we're going to talk about not defunding police versus defunding police, can we please make sure that they're not wasting their time on someone looking at a pot plant? 
Absolutely. I mean, if pot, if, if the end goal is to take pot off the streets, your day is a waste. Mm -hmm. exactly. if, that, if your whole career was built on taking marijuana users off the streets, your whole career was a waste. Yeah. Yep. And rather than get angry about that, which I would be, but rather than do that, you have to change. You have to change the laws. You have to change yourself and you have to put things in perspective of, is this actually making society worse or right. am I the police officer making society worse by spending, wasting my time following these leads? Well, I, I'm really interested to, I'm excited to learn more about what it takes to become a police officer and that process in part three of this series, because I don't know how much, and I guess freedom is not a good word, but I'm going to say freedom, like how much freedom police officers get to determine what is important and what is not. Like how much is it so that like, they have to follow these like Just commands? to give like a little, little hint about what we're going to talk about. Basically, they do have a lot of things that they have to follow. They can't just do anything. But once the thing is done, there is a lot of ways to justify it. Mm -hmm. So it's it goes back to that. It's it's better to you know what's that saying like like better to ask for permission or or, or you know worse to ask for for permission than to just try it and ask for, for forgiveness. Yeah. Something you know. So I think it kind of goes back to that. Like officially, they're not supposed to do a lot of the things they do, but once they do it, there is a code of protection that very few people get. Um, so Odale. Uh, conducted 1,400 raids, many of which without warrant, dozens of wrong addresses, innocent families terrorized at gunpoint by cops. Most of the crimes were supposedly committed that were supposedly committed were nonviolent drug crimes. Um, the innocent people that were terrorized by this group would be dismissed as an insignificant detail um, of just cops trying to do their jobs. Um, Odell ended without being renewed. Be, uh, and and the remaining agencies became the modern day DEA, the Drug Enforcement Association. Now, I do want to say that things are not quite as bad as they were at the beginning, at least not against middle class white people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think they're probably worse for people of color um, than they have ever been. But for but for white people, they have gotten better. Uh, th there was a general um, backlash in the press because of because of the press and, and mm -hmm. the, the, the attention that they they sh they shined on this. Um, and the reason for that was the public could not get behind middle class white people being treated as criminals. Right. Um, sadly. If if these people had been the stereotypical cliche um, black criminal that a lot of people have pushed forward, I, I think we might still be dealing with with helicopters and and mm -hmm. you know this happening in on pot farms. Um, but for whatever I guess good you can get out of this, at least they don't do it quite as often, not quite as brazenly, mm -hmm. uh, not at least not as big right. <laughs> as they did back then. Well, um, and a big part of why that is no longer today, and it, it's part of this irony that I've been pointing out, is um, thanks to, as we talked about it in the first part of the series, the uh, Warren Court years, um, huge defender of uh, the rights of citizens and personal liberty, all of this brought forth what is known as the Castle Doctrine. Which is actually an old British law that um, the United States um, kind of adopted after all this, but it it became a huge part of federal rights and a huge part of states' rights. Yeah, and the the main concept behind it is uh, from from the UK was an Englishman's home is his castle, mm -hmm. um, and and the idea is you do not enter my castle lest you want war. <laughs> 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 um and 
like it's one of those things that I think like if there's a libertarian listening right now, they just did an F yeah and like honked their horn. Oh, 100%. Or, or, or a Texan <laughs> where we have like if you step on te- a Texan's property, you shoot first, ask questions later. I think Montana right? actually has the strongest castle doctrine of um, the entire United States. Um, it's they like do. Montana and then Texas, I believe. Um, um, Alaska might a- be up there too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Any penguins come onto my property. <laughs> There's a joke in The Simpsons where uh, Homer is, is it's a Halloween episode, so it's everything's kind of bigger than it mm-hmm. normally is, but he hates his neighbor Flanders and and uh and he hears that that anything that you do to someone who's on your property is good and legal. And like and so he's like, Hey Flanders, come over here and and as as Flanders is coming over, uh Chief Wiggum like whispers in Homer's ear, uh it doesn't work if you invite him and he's go <laughs> he's like, Crap <laughs> Flanders go home. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, the, the castle doctrine is a really messy thing. You know, I remember we had a case in, uh, Missoula there, um, when I was in high school. So back in 2000, I think it happened in like 2011. Um, and there was a case where some, a couple high school students, one of them being a German foreign exchange student actually, broke into they'd been breaking into some garages and it was a part of a game where they would break into garages and then steal beer out of the fridges you know and one night they broke into a garage and uh the owner of the home came out and the garage door was opened like halfway or whatever and he came out and i think the where the loophole was is he couldn't shoot with lethal force if he wasn't being shot upon or something like that Right. Um, but he went out and basically blindly shot because they ran out and he blindly shot through the garage door um, at a level that was too, it would have been at their torsos. And that was a big part of their debating. Was he shooting at a lethal angle or not? And I think it was determined he was. Um, but there's, there's something else you're not saying, though, that what? like. What I missed. This guy actually left his garage door open. Right. Because he bait people he to baited, steal from him yes. so he could do this. That's right. That was it because it had been happening in the neighborhood. That's right. And he baited them to come do it by leaving his garage door open. That's why it was open halfway. That's like a, a bad CSI episode. Like, mm-hmm. that's horrifying. <laughs> but he, he ended up, he shot and killed this German foreign exchange student. And I remember in my German class, we had. Um, Henrietta Lurvish, who is, uh, she was a journalism teacher at UM, and she came and talked to us in my German class, and we talked about it, and um, she, I, I believe she, like, met the uh, the kid's family, they came here, and um, they were, it was a big struggle to figure out how to get his body back to Germany, um, but I remember that was the first time I had really heard about the Castle Doctrine, and it was an absolute mess, like, it was a huge mess. It's actually used on both sides of the cop debate too, because um, so so it's so so there was at least one case um, that I read about where a um, a night watchman he was uh, a neighborhood watchman he was uh, off duty but he saw someone that he he thought was suspicious they were suspicious because they were wearing a hoodie and they were black there was no other real reason but he did you know there i guess there were a break-in or something break-ins that would have been happening so he was on edge or whatever and uh he approached the person something happened that's a little unclear about uh, a scuffle that happened a uh, person ended up being shot and killed um and he claimed self-defense and so the castle doctrine also kind of covers this idea of like of, of justifiable homicide um, if you're in self-defense, if you're protecting your life or your property, um, like meaning either literal home property or your car or something like that, um, that, that you can get away with it. Um, as far as I know, uh, his name was Zimmerman. He, he did, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was successful. He did get away with it. Um, but it was always a little bit shrouded in, in, in doubt as to whether or not the person actually intended him harm, um, or not. Um, so it's also used by people to defend uh, shooting people uh, that uh, that are encroaching upon them or their their space um, at the same time as a defense against police and raids breaking into your home uh, without a warrant or sometimes 
a lot of people think that even with a warrant, it's still not right. Like, it shouldn't be legal um, to to break into your home unless there's an actual emergency. Um, so it's used against cops, and it also is used for cops. So right about this time, uh, this this is sort of the early '70s. There was there was a lot of rules that were changing because of the public outcry. The DEA set up uh, a lot of new rules that that uh, in which they had to personally sign off on no knock uh, drug warrants, which is something that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, now it's just mm-hmm. a judge that's usually signing hundreds of these. Right. Um, and so it's it the the scrutiny that was going on then is not at all what it goes on now. You can get a no knock drug warrant for almost any reason without question. Um, mm. There was one judge um, that the book mentioned that had been responsible for like it was like like fifty plus percent of all of the city's warrants, and in like his entire time on the bench, he had only like questioned like a couple of them. I like, wow. got thousands um and even the ones he questioned he ended up going with the police's opinion that that this was this needed a no-knock warrant because they could get rid of evidence or something like that mm-hmm. um, but at this time um, um a lot of uh conservatives actually were against no-knock raids um and they spoke out quite a bit um about the bad cops and bad police um, practices uh, this quote from the book, uh, tough on crime, law and order rhetoric had been a winner. Most quote, quote unquote, ignored Americans didn't think of themselves as criminals. And so they could never picture themselves in need of a Miranda warning, an empathetic judge or the advantages of preparing a defense from outside of a jail cell. But these Americans experiencing the no knock raids and those people that were killed in humble had homes. And many of those people that were on the other end of these raids were gun owners. So they basically looked like them, uh, right. and as a Democrat group, uh, they were likely to revere the castle doctrine. And so no polling exactly data exists exactly at the time. Um, but the increased media coverage did, uh, lead to a lot more stringent rules at the time, at least, uh, for what kind of raids could be done. This, this definitely seems like an instance where the hysteria couldn't really keep up with the fear that people had or the protection that people had over their personal well-being where this was an instance where oh if this happened to me this would not Mm -hmm. be good because it could happen to me right there's been several politicians that that have kind of gotten themselves in trouble because they'll say something like oh if somebody broke into my house i'd shoot them right away right and then they get in trouble with saying wait did you just say you would shoot a cop and and they have to like back off on that even though they they would be just like anyone you know fearful for their life not knowing it's a cop and they would probably shoot at them but but they they don't know where to stand on this it's a very confusing thing for especially for for conservative politicians Mm -hmm. right i know i would be terrified if my door got caved in and my house was raided by a bunch of cops like that'd be terrifying well and you wouldn't know they were cops you would think this is a home invasion or something like you don't know who the bad guy is when you're woken up at 2 a.m uh and and especially if you're an innocent person and you're and your neighbor was actually the one that they should have broken into like can we do like i know that this is like uh you know this is some people some people think this is up for debate but that's what brianna taylor's boyfriend said was when he had a gun ready to shoot the cop right he thought they were there was someone breaking into their house mm-hmm. like they were terrified they didn't know it was the police right well and, 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 and even if you are a, a person that let's say sells drugs or does drugs that doesn't mean that you are also a violent criminal so you know so you might exactly. not have shot at somebody at, at if you knew they were the police you might have been really docile about it but because these people are using this force and breaking in now you are have raised yourself to a violent criminal because you don't know who they are mm-hmm. right I mean, we would all have the same reaction, right? If we woke up in the middle of the night and someone was like banging in our door, I would grab the nearest weapon. <laughs> like, I yeah. it just seems like a very normal reaction. So it's crazy to expect people to act inhuman. I, I mean, I, I guess they expect like you're in the middle of the night, the, the window gets broken. I guess before you shoot them, you're supposed to say, wait, are you the cops or are you the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> like you have to identify yourself or it's not legal. Like, <laughs> right. So in 1974, this is kind of an interesting like like tie back into a lot of like American 
Americana culture that I just I hear so much about this like they're making another movie about it coming out pretty soon This was a big a big part of so many different movies about the 70s um, We're gonna talk about Patty Hearst for just a second and there was a really successful uh, SWAT moment that was broadcast across the nation and captured everyone's attention um, when the SWAT was uh, taking down the, the Symbionese Liberation Army who had taken Patty Hearst um, uh, a uh, an arguably innocent um, girl who who was brainwashed or at least just young and stupid mm -hmm. and decided to be part of these people, um, and uh, and and they they uh, they were definitely an organization that meant to do harm. I believe they took over a bank. Um, that's where and that's what the uh, the situation was. And so it was not like the Black Panthers who basically just you know were were holding guns defense and didn't didn't do harm unless they were provoked. Like these people were actual, like, like kind of were, like domestic terrorists. They were active. Yeah. They and this active. was exactly the situation that you want SWAT teams. Like you want militarized cops. You don't want everyone to be that way, but when the situation calls for it, mm -hmm. you want this special team to go out for this. And no one is arguing against that. <laughs> if you, if you want a, uh, a good uh, tell of uh, Patty Hearst, I guess, kidnapping and joining of this group uh watch that episode of drunk history um <laughs> it's very entertaining <laughs> drunk history is surprisingly um a surprisingly great source of information i remember the guys that 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 uh runs that show he said something like 90 percent of what we say is accurate like mm -hmm. and well, that is plenty because they <laughs> hire to write the scripts that the actors and comedians read they hire a bunch of uh, UCLA history students, yeah, to write it. So they, it, it, it's not bad. <laughs> I mean, some days you know they might make a drunk history episode out of one of our episodes. Hey, so that would be really cool. We can only I, dream, right? The day will I, come. I would love that. <laughs> so, so 1975 SWAT teams are the coolest thing in America. Um, you know, the whole culture of America just falls in love with it partly because there's a new show called SWAT. Um, and, uh, and, and due to that popularity, cops across the nation wanted to copy what they were doing in the big cities um, in their medium size to small cities. Um, so, uh, so, you know, in the bigger cities, SWAT teams were used well in some cases to take, to take down violent situations, but in smaller cities, they might not have been quite as needed. Um, mm -hmm. And the people who were joining the SWAT teams were not getting the same level of education and training um, and prevention of violence that the people in the big cities had gotten. So, right. you know, in some cities, like if the whole, if the whole squad was only like 30 people, everyone got in. <laughs> there was no like passing a bar. It was just like, everyone's also a SWAT SWAT team right. member. <laughs> yeah, time to call call the SWAT team. We're already here. Like, <laughs> right? I know we're already here. Why we we just got to put on some vests and hold some bigger guns, and there we go. Now, now, uh, you know, this town of five thousand people, we have our very own SWAT team to protect the water tower. <laughs> to protect, to the, protect water the water tower. Water <laughs> tower. Oh, it's a good touch. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the, the Rise of the Warrior Cop talks at length um, about uh, this report from this um, this scholar uh, who did some research on SWAT teams and actually uh, went on several SWAT raids and and kind of just bunkered in with a lot of SWAT teams. And, and the guy's name was Kra Kraska, um, and he uh, he he quoted different things that the police were saying. And in this report. Um, it, it was kind of it was kind of scary because for the first time people started understanding that police weren't just doing this because they had to. They were doing it because they got a lot of fun out mm -hmm. of being SWAT teams and kicking down people's doors. Right. It, 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 we talk about with uh, in DC where they had the what was it, it was the mundane tasks. Right. And when you, <laughs> when you yeah when you talk about sensationalizing police work. You don't want the mundane task of putting in regulating streetlights and you know all that. You want to kick down some doors and stop crime. You know, you want to be a hero, and I get that. And there is something really great about that kind of a person, but only when it's needed. 
There's actually a movie, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was made in like 2016 or something, and he's he's you know that he was <laughs> I know he was this big time police officer in Los Angeles, and now he's in this small town where he's the sheriff, and he has two deputies, and the young deputy he dreams of being a cop in the big city and you know, he wants to go do what he did. And Arnie is like, you know, it's not as great as you think. And he's about to be transferred. Not as great as you think. Right. And then the big <laughs> conflict happens and he dies. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but it plays along the lines of like, what do you want to do when you go into police work? You want to be the hero. You want to kick down doors. You want to do the sensationalized things that at this time, everyone was talking about and everyone thought was needed and this guy that wrote the report kraska he had a really great quote that was that was in in the rise of the warrior cop he said uh he that so so he so he wanted so the 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 swat team basically wanted him to to shoot at a target they were at like a like a target range and and they were kind of like you know being men you know that kind of thing and um and he missed his target and suddenly he found himself defending his manhood to these strangers that, that mm-hmm. otherwise were just a part of this study that he was doing. And the quote is, I, I realize that in a sense, I am basking in the security of my temporary status as a beneficiary of state sanctioned use of force. But on a personal level, what disturbs me most was how I, as a person who had so thoroughly thought out militarism, could have so easily enjoyed experiencing it uh, that this study illustrates the expansive and seductive powers of deeply embedded ideologies of violence. Mm-hmm. You know, so in a way, like like this became addicting uh, right. to a lot of cops. You know, uh, it's it, like a lot of cops described it as a huge rush. You know, like it, like this was the reason they became cops. I'm sure it has to be. I mean, it's similar to me when I'm uh, photographing protests and riots. Right. You know, I'm like, when I'm in those moments, like, yeah, it's dangerous and there's a lot of stuff going on, but I'm like, let's go. Like, you know, this is why I'm doing this. And, and you know, they were kind of, th- the book was kind of theorizing that that maybe this huge rush is, is and it's kind of in a similar way to a drug, and people want that that feeling. So rather than do the safer thing of like waiting for an easier or safer time to arrest somebody and just doing it in a small way, they would rather kick down somebody's door at 2 a.m., you know, yell, get down on the ground, because that is more appropriate to what they feel a cop should be. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're going to get more into no-knock raids and all that stuff in a yes. later episode, but we we should move on. Dalen, do you want to do the one on forfeiture? I feel like this one is like, I feel like it's just kind of right up your alley. I, I don't know why you think forfeiture is up my alley. Because, um, because like you and I are both nerds, and uh, Kara, you are too. We're all, we're all nerds, and like, the, like, and like <laughs> the idea that that like money is 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 incentivizing. Mm-hmm um where police have gone is just such like a nerdy like like thing so okay so (laughs) as curtis writes here a cash cow for police departments was made legal at this time and as we just mentioned forfeiture so up until the 1970s the government couldn't take property that wasn't directly used in a crime and i think that's that's really important because that's an easy way to manipulate things but then up to that time the only thing they could do uh for example if they shut down a brothel like they could shut down the brothel it, but they couldn't take the money that the brothel right. uh, was used you know or, or the, you know the, the money came from to buy somebody a car or something like that and so in 1981 uh, uh gao what is gao it's a government report. I've is actually I've, I've heard that before. Yeah, it's I forget what it stands for, but it's it it's basically just a a, a report the right. government does. So it was commissioned by now President and then Delaware Senator Joe government Biden. Government Accountability Office. Oh, government okay, thank you. Um, pops, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, so um, a 1981 GAO report commissioned by Joe Biden, then Senator of Delaware. Um, 
uh, it was commissioned to have uh, Reagan's people, um, the idea that government wasn't utilizing forfeiture nearly enough, and it was an opportunity to collect this revenue, um, or opportunity to collect this revenue was being wasted. So basically, this report saw it as it, they were wasting a chance to make money. They were wasting a chance to bring in money. Um, so the law originally intended to take mobsters things, um, didn't pass until the seventies and wasn't used until Reagan this broadly. Um, Nixon thought it was, uh, easily misused and didn't want to try it, which I think that was the thing <laughs> that Nixon did actually quite a bit is he saw things and was like, eh, we'll, we'll go away from that. And then he just went really hard we'll into later. other things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, it's like, it's bad if Nixon thinks it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know it's bad yeah. <laughs> even nixon was like i don't know guys but <laughs> i think people and i think joe biden especially early, early in his career he was so eager to prove himself mm -hmm. that joe biden went hard on a lot of these things and a consistent thing that was there as we're seeing with nixon and reagan is the war on crime the war on drugs well, it was a consistent and this thing is perfect this is perfect because for Joe Biden because it's a moderate issue. So he's a Democrat. He likes to tax things. So this is kind of a tax, but it's a tax on criminals. So the average person is going to be like, that's not me. That's somebody else. So they're going to be more okay with it because it punishes criminals but brings in revenue. So that's right. like, like I can't think of a more perfect moderate standpoint uh, for, for Joe Biden to want to show both sides that he could, you know, walk the line mm -hmm. and so this was also the point where reagan brought in the fbi to the drug war and the fbi had actually been resistant on this because they saw it mostly as a losing issue and it often brought a lot of corruption um yeah because it motivates cops to to take to take things first and and figure out if it's legal later exactly but they started small they started actually focusing on marijuana with the classic, it's a gateway drug. And so they started on marijuana users. <laughs> exactly. That's, exactly. That's exactly what they're going to do. And so they started uh, really focusing hard on marijuana. And I think um, we see through all the way through the 90s, the DEA goes really hard on marijuana. Yeah, and one of the things that, that, that this mentions here, too, is that so at, at the same time, so marijuana was really common, right? right. So it was some, they considered to be an untapped revenue source. Um, and because, I mean, reg, just I don't want to say regular people. That's not that's kind of getting away from like the us and them thing. But mm -hmm. but it's like I just say a majority of people had connections to marijuana that didn't necessarily have further connections to other drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there was a, it was just a, a, a wider net that they could cast, but at this, but in order to do that, like they had to vilify marijuana even more than it already had been. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and talk about just how terrible it really was. Well, it's funny. You said you, you just said you, you don't want to split us and them. You said, you know, regular people, but that's literally exactly what they did. And so they, they right. brought in this guy, Carlton Turner, who you have down as the drug czar. Um, and so at the time, he was America's only legal uh, pot plant or pot plant researcher. researcher. And he had his own pot plot where he would research marijuana. And so they brought him as basically their expert the on marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was just completely talking one-sided. Um, he... Uh, he actually asked libraries to remove any previous reports that suggested treatment of drug users uh, to re rehabilitation. Just took out anything that rehab helped uh, drug users. Yeah, yeah. Well, and specifically marijuana. Like, yes. so they knew at that time that marijuana had a lot of really positive benefits for people like cancer victims, you yeah. know, or, or cancer patients. And and so he had actually he actually had the libraries remove the research that that could have helped people because they they really wanted this drug to be the devil and nobody to like it for any reason and it also had an extra effect of they could put it at the worst level the worst classification of what um uh, of what drugs could be classified as because if a drug has a medicinal use it gets put lower automatically mm -hmm. like if it's helpful to society so he removed all references to that. 
Well, now with this drug czar in place, and now with the focus put so much on marijuana, Reagan actually moved his attention away from programs that uh, treated drug addiction and treated, you know, with rehabilitation because according to this drug czar, it didn't work. It was, it was impossible. They were lost causes. And so they've put all of their focus of uh, pot users into law enforcement. And as Curtis, you highlighted here, um, some people were just born bad, which is a big yeah. statement. It is. Uh, it's um, it's a really unfortunate one. It's the these people don't deserve help. They are uh, evil from the get go, and the fact that they do drugs proves it. And like, there's this interesting cyclical thinking from from this argument that like it's like the drug makes a person bad, and the person's bad because they do the drug. You know, like like it's it's it's, it's, it's a, it... Circle. People that think like that just to me, sh it, I mean, it's just ignorance, right? Like if you don't understand the nuances and complications that lead people to drug use, then you just, you're ignorant and mm -hmm. that's all there is to it. There's, I don't really think there's an argument there other than ignorance. Right. Well, and we, we see Reagan, who is the, the king of modern day Republicanism where, and I just I, say no, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the common theme that I pointed out. It's this, this irony of big government versus small government where Reagan repetitively criticized the expansion of government, but he also asked for new powers to stop drug proliferation. He asked for new powers to fight drugs. He asked for new powers to stop marijuana. You know, it was this, it was this constant back and forth of no government, but we need more government and more power to stop the things that we want to stop. That's why I have more respect for li libertarians than just, say, a Republican, because libertarians usually take their belief to its its logical end, uh, whereas Republicans will be like, small government, small government. Oh, wait, you want to get an abortion? Big government's going to stop you. Right. Oh, you want to smoke pot? Big government's going to stop you. Whereas a libertarian's like, okay, I don't like abortion. I don't like pot, but I don't think it's the government's right to tell you not mm -hmm. to. Well, and Not even Reagan, he kind of went with the contradiction by saying, just blaming everything on big government. All the bad stuff was because of big government. But in order to stop big government, you need big government to prevent the bad things that have been caused. But it's like, it's, it's, it's exhausting. <laughs> and, and Reagan <laughs> doubled down on this idea of, of crime being out of control. And, it, and we're always just one step away from anarchy. Therefore we need the thin blue line to protect us from it. And the quote here from Reagan was for all, for all our science and sophistication, all of our justified pride and intellectual accomplishment, we must never forget the jungle is always there waiting to take us over. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that's almost a racist statement. Like, I, I could see that being a dog whistle, right. um, you know, against people who are black and brown. Um, I, I hope he didn't mean it that way. Who knows? I actually don't know a ton about Reagan. Um, but to me, that really kind of um this it just felt wrong how he put that so in 1981 uh the military uh, cooperation with law enforcement act was passed um which further encouraged the military to train drug police on military tactics um, and to have the police access to military intelligence um in terms of drug smuggling so this was the first time that the military was married mm -hmm. with the police forces um, which kind of gets us into that territory of is the police now a standing army that the forefathers specifically did not want us to 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 have mm -hmm. because that's what we got away from and you know in in with the kings and, and and you know in the the army that would march through the streets and all that stuff like that that is not American and and was never supposed to be part of the deal but here we go where they're working together for a good reason, they think, because, you know, this idea of eliminating drugs, but they're doing so at the peril of, of our liberty. Mm -hmm. Well, we're seeing this snowball continue, and it got to the point where now even Reagan wanted to expand asset for forfeiture power to make it easier for the government to take property away from people who have never even been charged with a crime. That's absurd. 
Like that just sounds, that's literally just theft. Like it's the, it's you're guilty until proven innocent, which is right. not yeah. the way the law is supposed to work. No, it does not work that way. But I, it seems like at the time where that was the case, like that was how they did things. It's, it feels like. So in 1968, there was a law that actually exempted specifically real estate from the types of property that could be seized. 1978, they, sorry. Excuse me, 1978. Um, that um, And that law was removed. That distinction was removed uh, okay. from Reagan. So now, now you could have your house taken away if the government said that they found um, a pot plant on your property. It was as simple as that. And to even further it, here comes our boy Joe Biden again, <laughs> um, just continuously eager to be tough on crime. He preempted Republicans with a bill of his own on asset forfeiture, which was that, is this the 1982 crime bill? Yep. So 1982 crime bill that passed 95 to 1. Like, yeah, so there was there was no debate against this at the time. People were all in on this idea. Democrats did not want to seem weak, um, mm -hmm. and Republicans were they were just they were just all for it because it was the criminals that were that were you know going to be affected, not real people, right? Not not people that deserve protection. There was so much support for this by the American public that if you did not stand with it. You, there was just no way for you to win as a politician. You there was you just could not succeed. This was the nine eleven like this, like of its time. Like as far as like the Patriot Act, that was kind of the same thing. Right. Like when they passed the Patriot yeah. Act, like I believe it was like three days after September eleventh yes. happened, which took away a lot of liberties, which created a whole government department that you know of Homeland Security and all that. That like there was one person in all of Congress in the four what is it four hundred thirty five people or something like that. Um, there was one person that voted against it, and there's a great interview with that person. Um, on an episode of Radio Lab that I, I I ask you to please look up because it was one of the first podcasts I ever heard, and they basically say, "I love my country. I wanted to to you know to support America, but this was not the way to do it. And be and because I voted against this, I was called names by everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, so one person stood up against the Patriot Act when it happened. Same thing here. There was very very little debate against it. Well, it's similar to uh, it was Jeanette Rankin was the only person to vote against bull or she was the only person to vote against World War One, and then I think one of two people to vote against World War Two. Right, and just you know. for reference, uh, she's a Montana figure, right? She was the first woman senator, is that yes. right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And she was uh, she was a pacifist. That was one of her things. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's you know sometimes you find yourself at odds with with. The entirety of Congress, just because you question if something is too severe or not. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so the so Reagan copied the task force idea. Uh, it it made these huge headlines that he was getting real tough on crime and tough on drugs and drug smuggling. Um, uh, and he even asked uh, America's jails and prisons uh, to start expanding because there was going to be a big influx of of drug users coming into. America's jails, which would absolutely is what happened. Um, a lot of people who were not criminals outside of doing drugs um, had their lives ruined by by this crime mm -hmm. bill, which is one of the main reasons a lot of um, black people today were not real excited about Joe Biden being yeah. president. Well, and this all ties in. So one, they needed more money. So forfeiture became a huge focus because they needed to find a way to bring in revenue. And two, as we talked in our private prisons episode, this is what jolted the prison industry back to life was all of this. And the libertarians are going to love this because this was incentive, right? Like, so police, if they weren't already completely focused on, on taking out the drugs from their community, now they were because with things like forfeiture, with things like the money that they were getting directly from the federal government, they had to show specifically that they were fighting crime. They were fighting drugs, whether like, like it was not as, as, as it didn't show as well on them. And it, they didn't get as much money if they simply stopped a murderer from killing a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. It was much, much better to, to stop low level drug offenders 
and put them away in jail to show that they were actually um, you know, using the money correctly and that they maybe even needed more money because they could do even better. It's kind of their version of, and we, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode, their version of like the informal ticket quotas of they need to arrest oh so many people to justify the money and thus get more money. Absolutely. And there was this organization that started CAMP, CAMP, where the hell do they come up with these? Um, <laughs> They conducted 524 raids, uh, arrested 128 people, seized 65,000 marijuana plants, many of which were actually, uh, oh, that was in their first year. Nationally, uh, other programs conducted 20,000 raids, destroyed 13 million uh, marijuana plants, and made 5,000 arrests. But a lot of those marijuana plants were just growing naturally, because guess what? It's a freaking plant. It just grows. Do you? I guess I didn't even realize pot plants grew wild in yeah. the United States. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that's how we discovered that it had those properties. It, it goes back to, like, Native American traditions. They just put it in pipes, and it felt good. Therefore, <laughs> they kept using it, it, you know? It felt good. And what's the crime in that? I would, uh, I would say, like, like you know, how many things did they smoke before they got to pot? You know, like, right. <laughs> they just, they just like, smoked everything and just kind of, like, oh, that's not that great. No, that's not that great. <laughs> it's like, uh, this we tried to smoke, uh, I don't know, uh, you, you know, uh, asbestos, and it made us cough. So asbestos. we... Uh, <laughs> and now I have cancer. Um, right. like... and, now I need, and now I need pot, so... <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so now we're in the 80s, uh, good old 80s. <laughs> uh, there's some interesting court cases that, that we can cover here. And you have, so it's uh, 1983 Illinois versus Gates. And you have a, a question here, Mark. It's, is an anonymous letter enough cause to do a raid? Which maybe it's yes. just me. <laughs> maybe it's just me, but I feel like the obvious answer should be no. <laughs> I feel like this is the precursor to like, you know, pearl clutching white people being like, there's a black guy barbecuing and I think they look suspicious. Like, like is that enough to like send in the cops? Like, no, <laughs> you know, like, like they don't actually look suspicious. They're just doing a barbecue. And, uh, and this is kind of like the old fashioned version of that. Somebody mm -hmm. wrote a letter and was like, I think there's something bad going on here. <laughs> So in, in Illinois v. Gates, um, there, were, there were two things before this uh, that need to be proven um, that info from an informant was reliable enough to establish probable cause. So one was that an informant was uh, credible, creditable. Mean, meaning they, they, that their numbers were high enough, yes. although that wasn't always the case. I, mean, I was saying like, you know, 50% of, of, their, of their advice turned out to be true or something like that right. actually might be considered reliable by by a court or by by a police officer and number two that the information was factual enough to reasonably think that the accusation might be true so if the informant isn't creditable enough if there is enough facts backing up their accusation backing up their claim then it is uh deemed uh established probable cause um, but they ruled that uh, totality of the circumstances was enough to determine probable cause without having to meet both or either of those requirements. And this started that idea of do it first, ask for forgiveness later, because no matter what they did, they could just say the totality of the circumstances was enough that we felt we had to go in. And they say, well, what was the actual you know, totality of the circumstances. Well, you know, some guy said that, that, you know, they had a pot plant in there and, and, you know, he had been there the day before. So that was enough. And when they, and then they're like, well, why'd you kick down the wrong door? They're like, oh, well we had bad information, but that's not our fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, we met our basic requirements and, and you'll just have to figure it out in the courts later. In uh, 1984 U S versus Leon, Good faith, quote unquote, good faith in cops' guess was enough for search warrants. So it's literally like, I've got a hunch. All right, here's a search warrant. Well, it's because, you know, cops are revered in our society by most people. Yeah. Um, so you want to believe them, you know. Um, but at the same time, you do have to understand that they are people. 
And just like anyone else, they see things incorrectly. They might lie if they have, you know, a reason to do so. And 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 the I it, it's nice to think that a cop everything a cop says is 100% the truth. You want to believe that, but that is just not human nature. But this case says if they say so, the good faith is we believe them. Mm-hmm. And is is this next one? Is this Nix versus Williams? Is that 1984 as well? I didn't write it down, and I don't remember. It was it was all if, if I think I wrote them down in rough order, so I believe it was in right so, around eighty four, roughly nineteen eighty four. Nix versus Williams, and this one's really scary. So, if police find evidence during an illegal search that they would likely have found if they had conducted a search legally, the exclusionary rule doesn't apply if uh, needing probable cause. So, basically, uh, the incentive to do things the right way, or else. Uh, uh, risk making evidence illegitimate was taken away in these rulings. So what this, this did, this, what yeah. this did was, if they did an illegal search and they found evidence that if they had done a legal search they would have found, then they can use that in court, regardless of it being an illegal search. I call this the it's Saul it, it's all good act. Because you can justify any mistake as long as you end up finding something. Mm-hmm. It's the search for, it's the search for a criminal. Like, so imagine <laughs> by any means. It, imagine it the Warren court's decision. By the way, yeah. that was the exclusionary rule. That was that was what we were talking about with the Warren yes. court. So it undid that idea. So imagine someone, uh, someone does, uh, police officers do a no knock warrant on your home, the wrong home. But in your home, they find drugs. They could charge you for possession of those drugs, even though they did an illegal no-knock warrant at the wrong address at your home. Like, that's terrifying. Or if they go into your home and they're doing it the right place and they find something, like, not even a part of it, they can add that to your charges. And that's terrifying to me. So this next one adds to the incentivization of police. Um, so it, in 1984, there, were, there was a law that gave police um, a, an actual cut of the assets that they that the criminals that that the criminals had that they auctioned off, and it went directly to the precinct. So before this, it I believe it went to the federal government. So there was very little incentive for an actual local precinct to really like you know go after the, the these high asset criminals. But now, if you got a high a, a criminal that had a lot of assets, um, you could really bring in the money for your precinct. And so, you know, it, it was a huge incentive um, to to actually wait until the person had the most assets mm-hmm. and then arrest them because you could get the biggest payday. And even at that on the opposite end, going after as many as possible to try and catch that person with the most assets, you know, imagine yeah. catching Pablo Escobar. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I feel like this is like almost like, like, like right for like a, a board game or something, you know, it's like, like you, can you get the you know biggest drug asset, you know, forfeiture, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, can, can you, you know, will your police precinct be the, be the richest in, in California or whatever. <laughs> It's it became like this hunt for the for the the biggest prize, and, mm-hmm. and when police start seeing things that way, it's not like let's just make our community better. It's like how can we bring in more? How can we get bigger? How can we bring in more money? Um, and it's not like they're not starting off from a place of being poor. You know, this is not like a like a a, a low income school or something like that that is just you know trying to get newer books or something like these are, you know, precincts that are all already doing really well. And this just magnified this problem of incentivization of, of going after drugs, um, even more during this time. Uh, there's a lot of people that had really, you know, had a lot of land and there would be like a single, uh, pot plant found on their land that they might not have even known was there that somebody else just planted, or maybe it just grew naturally. And they actually had to prove their innocence. And if they didn't, their land could be taken away. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, it was scary. This is like, this is like 1984 shit, you know? I mean, th- this is, this is really, 
Um, this is government big brother basically right in your business accusing you and you have to prove your innocence. Wasn't this literally 1984? Didn't you say that? <laughs> yeah. I didn't, like, actually, I didn't actually mean to, yeah, that, but yeah, you're right. 1984, 1984 was a when, busy when year. When life imitates art, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the worst way. <laughs> Back to Daryl Gates, one of the most important figures um, in policing, um, was head of the LAPD. Yep. Um, he, one of the things he's most famous for, depending on how you look at this whole thing, is either famous because it makes him a badass or because he took it, the SWAT team idea and raids to the absolute extreme. And this is actually depicted in the film uh, uh, Straight Outta Compton. Um, did I get that right? Wait, it's Compton, right? Yep. Yeah. Straight yeah, okay. It was a, I've, I've seen so many memes where it was like straight out of, you know, like <laughs> Brooklyn or whatever that like I had to remember what the original one was. Um, but yeah, you know, and this is actually depicted in the movie Straight Outta Compton where he actually – got permission well he actually did it and got permission later but either way he got he he got an armored vehicle with a battering ram and actually started busting down people's walls Jesus. in order to make sure he got the drugs before before they um they could get rid of them and also he got this vehicle under the guise of olympics protection because they're right. and he just he just kept it and then he painted it blue. Um. I mean, the only thing he could have done that would have been more ridiculous is he could have played like the Olympics music as he was busting it down. <laughs> he should have been the person like carrying the torch as he drove this thing right. down the oh stadium. You know? <laughs> oh my! I mean, uh, he probably had dreams like this. This guy was he really saw himself in a much different light than I think history right. is going to see him. Um. 1984, again, Reagan signed that the National Security Division Directive 221, which designated illicit drugs a threat to U.S. national security, in addition to adding uh, to the drug in interdiction responsibilities of agencies like the CIA and the State Department. Um, so they, he basically brought the drug uh, war to more departments that had to deal with it. Um, and... Uh, and, and further incentivize them than going after it. It's actually really funny if, if anyone's have any of y'all watched Narcos. I haven't seen that on Netflix. So in it, so it's the DEA, these two DEA agents going after Pablo Escobar, and they share like an office at the embassy um, in Colombia with the CIA, these CIA agents, and basically throughout the entire show. It's the running theme that the CIA just does not care about the drugs. They just do not care about stopping Pablo Escobar or anything. It's just a headache for them, basically. And so they always just get pissed at the DEA agents who take it so seriously. And so it's just kind of it, it's a, a funny thing that they show is the CIA was just like, like it's just this, drugs. It doesn't matter to us. Like we have more important things to focus on. So in 1987, um, a law Congress passed order the secretary of defense and the u.s attorney general to notify local law enforcement enforcement agencies each year about the availability of surplus military equipment um the 1033 program was the one set up the um from the pentagon um and it and it actually to this day is is something that they they specifically contact police departments to give them surplus military equipment hmm. so this is a reason why you don't want the military to just keep gaining money even when we're not in the war because it creates a surplus that stuff that's supposed to be used like drones supposed to be used on on you know enemy combatants is suddenly in the hands of mayberry police department and they're using it to stop people smoking pot like wow. that's essentially the the, the the line of events that happen over and over again and it's happening today it just seems so overboard it like is. well and it's funny because i think like without looking at this most people say oh well it was to stop the cartels it was stop this but when you look at why things were actually created it is as simple as that it was to stop people from smoking weed like it, it just escalates to such grand proportion that it's just like <laughs> oh my god you really have also, to think about it. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say get a life. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of going to say the same thing. Like, I would say, like, you know, you have to ask yourself who is creating the chaos. Is it the, you know, the, the guy smoking a doobie or is it you kicking in the door? Like, mm -hmm. like you're creating I, the chaos. 
I understand that the reasoning for a lot of this drug, you know, craze was because like the source of drugs. And I think that yes. if that's where you want to be concerned because a lot of times the source of growing drugs that are illegal is dangerous. It's very narcos like, you know, like mm -hmm. it's it puts people in bad situations. So like that's your issue. Okay. But I I I get that. I don't understand, yeah, necessarily going after the person smoking the joint. Like by that time you've lost, you know, you're done. The chain yeah. of command is done. Like, like yeah. let it go. Well, you're kicking so, in the doors of suburbs at that point. It's, right. it's so strange to me to like focus your efforts on those people. Because well, by that point, we're we're done with it. <laughs> but I think you have to look at the perspective though, right? Like it was so hard to capture drug kingpins. It was so hard to yeah. capture the people running these cartels. So what do you do? You focus on the people who are in your backyard because those are the people that are out front. Those are the people where you see their faces. That's the low fruit, though. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like, it, how much good it, are you yeah. doing? You know, the person that is it has already messed up their life that basically just needs help. You but, know, mm -hmm. you're calling how, them a criminal and you're, and you're ignoring the source. How much does it matter how much good you're actually doing or how much good the public thinks? thinks you're actually doing right? right and so perception was a huge part of it because they knew they couldn't catch pablo they knew they couldn't catch many of these large cartels that it was basically like three cartels that were running it um out of uh, south america and mexico and so if they could create the perception that something was being done and i think it got to the point where they convinced themselves that something was actually being done that's I feel like matters more than actually stopping the true bad guys. Well, and a lot of what cops do get totally ignored. Like your story about about the cop that uh you know helped push the the guy's car to the gas station. Right. You know st stuff like that. To the community policing is important. So you know when you have these debates about eliminating the police, they're not really usually at least talking about. Things like that, like the things that that are actually good deeds and actually mm -hmm. the things that actually matter. It's it's this stupid stuff that we get entangled in because somebody thought that you know th that this person doing this drug um, would be better you know in a jail cell than in a, a clinic, right? Or on their couch just smoking a bowl, like you know whatever yeah. it may be. Um, but. We've talked about it a lot, how it's this snowball of allowing police officers to get more weapons, get more money, get more power, get more jurisdiction, get more leeway, and get more uh, allowances within the justice system. And a big part of now is stretching all the way back from the 1800s. A big reason for that is something that is called qualified immunity. <laughs> And I've been waiting so long to get to this point because I think a lot of people here, especially in recent years with uh, the police brutality cases that have been going on, is qualified immunity gets thrown around like crazy. Um, and qualified immunity, um, it, it's this shadow that is cast over basically every single police officer and their daily actions. Um, and it's something that a lot of people don't really know what it is. And it's actually really controversial um so to talk about where qualified immunity comes from we're going to go all the way back to uh, the civil rights act of 1871 so hold on to your wigs folks i know right and so uh, <laughs> what most people don't uh, realize is that there before the civil rights act of 1965 there was an earlier one the civil rights act of 1871 uh, which gave Americans the right to sue public officials who violate their legal rights. Um, that was one big part of the act. Um, and so the modern analog is uh, U.S. Code 1983, um, and it states uh, if a government official violates your rights, you can file a lawsuit to hold the public official financially accountable for their actions. Wow. Sounds great, right? Sounds awesome. And so here's an instance. In so far, <laughs> here's an instance um, of a court case where uh, this actually happened. So it was Monroe v. Pape. Uh, the act was uh, initially interpreted um, as intended by the Supreme Court. So in Monroe v. Uh, Pape, the Monroes, a black family, were suing the Chicago Police Department after a police raided their house without a warrant, rounded up the family, made them stand naked in the living room 
while the officers ransacked the house. I mean, ripping open couch cushions, tearing beds, pulling apart dresser, just absolutely just ripping up the so, carpet. It's so dehumanizing. <laughs> oh, 100%. I mean, you think of this family in their living room, round up like wild animals, naked, while police officers destroy their home looking for and, something and that's that not there. before that's not like the criminals being arrested you know and even yeah. if they were you're still you're still able to have access to some type of dignity like mm -hmm. these people weren't even being arrested and so uh the officers did actually make an arrest the night of james monroe mm -hmm. um and he was detained and interrogated for hours but they didn't know going into the house, right? That they were about to arrest them. They had to find something. I don't believe, I can't remember um, why they uh, raided the house. Um, okay. It was without a warrant. I think it was a, a case where. Um, it's it almost was, always an informant. Yeah, it was, it was mm -hmm. most likely unsubstantiated claims by an informant. Um, and so Justice uh, William Douglas wrote in his opinion that the Supreme Court recognized uh, that the Civil Rights Act allowed the Monroes to sue the officers for violating the civil rights. Um, the court explained that the purpose of the Civil Rights Act was to give a remedy to parties deprived of constitutional rights, privileges, and immunities by any official's abuse of his position. And I think wow. from this description of this case, I think we can all agree it was a huge abuse of their position. Um so over time and in recent years, the Supreme Court basically gutted the purpose of the act, creating its legal defense, qualified immunity. Uh, the Supreme Court created the doctrine of uh, qualified immunity in 1967, describing it as a modest exception for public officials who acted in good faith and believed that their actions were uh, authorized by law. So it goes back to the whole idea of, well, they meant it in good faith, therefore it's justified. And it also goes to the idea too of like, like, like you, you can't know what they were thinking and that they were acting in good faith. So you basically have to go on the good faith that they are an officer. And of course they did everything, you know, by the book. And of course they, they did things with, with a complete, uh, you know, a, a, a predisposition of like, of 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 perfect goodness mm -hmm. like like you know so like it goes back to the idea of like like i don't know why when somebody puts on a a uniform that makes them perfect yeah it doesn't <laughs> well and that that was kind of the point of this is they it, it was a way to recognize that police officers aren't perfect and so it protected poli police officers <laughs> from civil action due to incidents caused by their actions while on duty but it assumes that they had a good intention. Yes. And so, and just as there are justified homicides, there are instances in where qualified immunity can be justified, though it's highly, highly debated and it seems pretty rare. But for example, in 2014, the Supreme Court held in Plumhoff versus uh, Ricard that police officers didn't use excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment when they shot and killed the driver of a fleeing vehicle to end a dangerous car chase. The court also held that even if the officer used excessive force, they were entitled to qualified immunity because it wasn't clearly established that shooting the driver in the circumstances amounted to excessive force. And so basically in this case, it was justified because they had to use this force in order to prevent further damage or further harm by this driver. And so that is an instance where, at least in my perspective and in the court's perspective, it was justified. Mm -hmm. uh, moving forward with Harlow v. Fitzgerald, um, this is a case where it greatly expanded the standards of qualified immunity. Um, the protection afforded by the doctrine would no longer rely on whether the official acted in good faith. So good faith is now out the window. Uh, this precedent was set uh, that even if the official acted maliciously in the in violating a person's rights, the official would remain immune unless uh, unless the victim's rights were clearly established. The court continued to interpret this as unless a previous case set the precedent for a specific situation in a specific wow. context, their oh rights gosh. could not be clearly established and qualified immunity would apply it's like they, they held you at gunpoint but you weren't naked therefore this is a different situation 100 percent 
unless the victim can point to a judicial decision that happened to involve the same context and conduct, the officer will be shielded from liability. So we see that original case of uh, the Monroe v. Pape where that happened and it worked. It, it was justified. They were able to sue and win for their violation of the rights. Today, if a black family was circled up in their house, they're on a no-knock warrant. with I, They didn't even have a warrant. Completely destroyed their house. They would lose the lawsuit due to qualified immunity because their family wasn't naked. Wow. So it, it, oh, it's it's absolutely baffling. Now, with that said, however, there is an exception. So looking at Hope B. Pelzer, the exception is basically that if the act is so cruel, so obvious, then qualified immunity does apply. So in Hope V. Pelzer, a correction officer is disciplined a prisoner by handcuffing him to a hitching post for seven hours with his hands above his shoulders, shirtless in the summer sun. At what point, a guard taunted the prisoner by giving him giving water to a guard dog in plain sight. Faced with these circumstances and no prior case that had confronted similar facts, the Supreme Court ruled the officer's cruelty was so obvious that they should have had fair warning that their conduct violated the constitutional protection against cruel and unusual punishment. So, the scary thing also about this is that because they don't, because the lawyers protecting the states and the governments don't want a precedent to be set, they're more likely to try to get people to settle out of court because mm -hmm. they don't want to give another, you know, reason on the books that somebody would have a precedent to, to, to get out in the future. Yeah. And so as we've been going through this entire episode and you question, why is there nothing holding police officers accountable? Why are, why are we as citizens not able to hold these bad cops accountable? And it's because of this. And the only way to beat qualified immunity is if there is a specific case, a specific, pre a specific precedent set in court that is the exact, literally to the T, the exact same as your circumstance, or if the violation is so obvious, so cruel, just so unusual, that it, there's just no choice but to uh, take qualified immunity out of the question, there's, there's nothing you can do to be. Those are the only two ways to defeat qualified immunity. Well, that's why the George Floyd verdict is so important because there's now precedent in court yes. under yeah. Derek Chauvin's verdict. Yeah. Um, that's It's a huge deal, not just because justice was sort of served, you know, but also because now moving forward, there is legal precedent but to that's convict. The, that's the scary thing, though, is because we've seen it in my research. I saw it on multiple cases where... That is true, and that precedent is set. But it can be so specific, though, yeah, that if it happens again, true. where instead of a knee, it's someone's elbow. Well, there's not a case of that. Sorry. Very true. You know, do you guys the the there is another profession that comes to mind um, with this type of immunity? Do you guys know what I'm thinking of by chance? Oh goodness, uh, the medical community. The medical community. Oh, yeah. So oh. doctors in general in the medical community, this includes pharmaceuticals, doctors, nurses, etc., have a very similar form of immunity. And the reasoning for that is because there is an argument that doctors are people, they're going to mess up, but right. they should they can't be too scared to perform their job, you yes. know, that that they're avoiding any type of possible R and D or like trying to like use their intuition on a patient. So we do have to protect doctors to some sense. And that's like the way I'm thinking about it in my mind. Like we do need to have laws that protect doctors because humans are human, human bodies fail. We do X, we do Y, we do Z. And we need to make sure that doctors can practice without constant fear of legal repercussions. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the only thing I can think of like in a profession that's similar to to this and like the justification of like, well, we need some protections in the place, but then if a doctor's, you know, 
slices you with a scalpel because they weren't paying attention. Like they shouldn't be protected from that. Yeah. So when I, I was, I, I was actually reading in research for this series. It was a police officer who, um, he actually holds like a PhD. Like he's, he's in, um, writes some incredibly brilliant article. And I think I have some of his stuff in my, uh, show notes, but he actually talked about the idea of doing, of rewriting the police code of conduct and making it more like the Hippocratic Oath because, um, you know, with the Hippocratic Oath, it's all about the preservation of life. And so I think we've seen within the narrative of policing over the past hundred years where so much of it is stop the crime at all costs and, you know, it's this line of division, us and them, where he wants to implement a new code of conduct where it's basically, it's preserve all life at all costs, whether it be you the victim or the perpetrator. And then police would be afraid to do, to say that though, because because that would make it official that that is their job. And Mm -hmm. and for some reason that is not like, that's not what's on the the contract they sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so that's qualified immunity. (laughs) And it's, it's really interesting. No, it's a reason that a lot of this keeps going, going forward. uh, Does, you know, kind of never stops, keep getting worse. Uh, you know, and we just kind of keep throwing money at this stuff. Um, there's a program called COPS, COPS, um, that was uh, implemented by Bill Clinton and then Senator Biden to hire more po- uh, more police. Um, and basically, they just gave a ton more money um, and didn't say what it was going to do. But a lot of liberal um, people and a lot of liberal news outlets uh, were really behind this uh, because it had a name that was similar to like community policing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was, but this, this one journalist from Oregon was quoted as saying the unfortunate truth about community policing as it is currently being implemented is that it's anything but community based. And that Portland basically like increased militarization of the police force using this and did not bother to read the details of what it would actually be used for. Kara, did you know, looking at Portland now and looking, did you know that Portland had increased militarization in their police back then? No, I didn't. I, I, all I know now is that the current relations between the police, the mayor and the city are worse than they've ever been. And they've ramped up militarization of the police. Um, and they do, they do problems. this under, under the guise that that SWAT teams are going to be there, military you know, equipment is going to be there mm-hmm. in case of terrorism or school shootings or hostage taking. You know, they use these big ideas to sell why they need it. But when it really comes down to it, it's something like 80, 90 percent of the of the cases that are that are used with this equipment are drug related. They're yeah. they're not these big events. They're not saving it for these moments. They're just using it because they have it. Yeah. And I think a lot of the poor, Portland in particular, and I think we've, we, are, we are seeing this around the country, we did see it um, last summer, um, was with the, the riots in Portland. And it really helped bolster the justification mm-hmm. for, well, we need these SWAT teams. And I was like, look, I get it. Some of those riots in Portland turned nasty. Yes. And it was scary to see my, you know, my home city like that. But it's also kind of funny to me that you you're talking about civilians. Granted, civilians that may have access to some you know pretty intense equipment, and you need a SWAT team for them. Kind of sounds like your community policing was already off to begin with. Well, and they call them in first too. You know, exactly. It's like one thing if 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 things get out of control and buildings are burning, and then you you know then you have to like create this, come in with a SWAT team or whatever. You think of it like like even like the January sixth thing. Yeah. Like they got in because they were not ready for them. No. Like mm-hmm. they had to attack the Capitol first. They had to do the insurrection first that justified the use of more force. Like that is actually how it's supposed to be. And even though I was really angry that, that, you know, they, that they did that to our Capitol building, um, it was the right thing to do. And it was a very measured approach to it. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that books, the book brings up what I thought was fascinating was when these big situations actually do happen, SWAT teams do not break in doors. They do not bust heads. When the Columbine massacre happened, one of the famous stories was that they waited 
for like, I think it was a couple hours right. before they went in because they, they, they didn't want to be in the line of fire because they didn't know what was going on in there. Mm-hmm. So even though there was all the motivation to use the, the full force of the SWAT team in a perfect, you know, ideal, terrible situation, uh, they didn't, and they don't usually. So like when the SWAT team's actually needed for these big things, they don't rush in. But when it's drugs, it's just gung ho. Right. There's a little bit here about the battle in Seattle protest that was a big jump forward um, in this idea of a protest zone versus a no protest zone. Um, Dalen, you saw the no protest zone when you were there at the inauguration, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, I didn't know that was a thing before you mentioned it on that episode. Yeah, I mean, so they, they definitely turned it into a no protest zone. Um, and they, they had a, um, I guess, a quote unquote free speech zone um, where, I mean, basically no one was there. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you, you look at the difference of the Black Lives Matter protest I was at where it was everybody open free speech. Here we go protest turned into i wouldn't call it a riot but a massive protest compared to inauguration day in dc where it was shut down entirely there was Mm -hmm. nothing Mm -hmm. well and this is a kind of a controversial thing that some cities are doing um it's probably not a good idea because it doesn't it doesn't let the steam out from from the people who are riled up um Mm -hmm. so i'm not sure if i agree with this um, but so in 1999, uh, when the battle in Seattle protests broke out, they were actually protesting, uh, the world trade organization, the idea of globalization, um, and 180 people were arrested, but they were arrested in a way that, that they were, they basically broke out of the protest zone into the no protest zone. They blocked intersections. They stopped delegates from getting to where they needed to go. And the police, instead of going about certain ways to to ask them to disperse instead they kind of corralled them arrested them all and they actually successfully sued the city um saying that that it wasn't uh it wasn't done correctly and and uh and uh the city settled i should say they actually didn't maybe win exactly but the city settled so they wouldn't have to deal with the fallout from that right the police chief norm stamper um had a great quote in the book um Rise of the Warrior Cop, uh, where he said, it was the worst mistake of my career. We gassed fellow Americans engaging in civil disobedience. We set a number of precedents, most of them bad, and police departments across the country learned all the wrong lessons from us. He said, that's disheartening. I mean, you look at what happened to those Occupy protesters at UC Davis when a cop just pepper sprays them down like he's watering a bed of flowers and I think we played a part in making that sort of a thing so common, so easy to do now. It's beyond cringeworthy. And I wish to hell my career had not ended on that note or had ended on a happier note is the actual quote. Man. Um, yeah. So he realized his part in this rise of militarization. That I don't think I've ever like really heard uh, a quote from a police officer and a police chief at that of really looking back in hindsight and saying, man, like I had a hand in this and I feel awful that I did. Yeah. You don't hear, you don't hear the human aspect of cops very often. It's almost always the official release of a, a statement from the city or something like that. And it's very cold and it's kind of like a thoughts and prayers sort of statement. Um, you don't really hear, the, the reality of the people behind the badge very often. Um, so yeah, I found, I found that to be incredibly humanizing um, of that, um, or, or that it way it did that. Right. Um, a two, 2005 report by the government accountability office found that, that while the violent crime rate uh, dropped 32% between 1993 and 2000, that at most the cops program um, accounted for two and a half percent of that decrease at a cost of eight billion dollars. Eight um, billion dollars. And Obama reinstated the cops program anyway, funding it with one point five billion. So now we're now oh. we're talking about billions of dollars that get put into this um, this little cyclical thing of uh, of them buying up tanks and other military gear and using it on protesters, not you know terrorists, not 
active shooters, but people who are protesting and in their case, in, in their opinion, getting too ro- too rowdy. That's where I I wonder if there hadn't been this divide, if it, if there hasn't been this narrative, or the the way protesters have been treated, if now protests wouldn't as likely be turned into violent events. You know, I wonder if throughout the past, you know, 60 years or whatever, if it, the narrative would have been different, if, you know, we wouldn't have had Portland, you know, burning up the way it did, if we wouldn't have, you know, the um, violent protests that I saw here in Austin, you know, I, I, you can say a lot of what ifs, you know, what are the alternatives, but with the norm that we've had since forever, um, you know, it's, it just feels like we're kind of stuck with it. A friend of mine who's very anti-police, um, I think to an extreme that I'm not completely comfortable with, and I've yeah. told him that before, he has the argument that situations like when the cops are, are macing um protesters especially ones that are that are peaceful um you know establish this this idea that protecting property is most important and mm-hmm. and the people are, are are far far you know second or third um and that property doesn't matter that it's you know that it's it's uh it's it's much more about the lives of people and society and if you're all you're doing is protecting whatever building you know that 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 they might uh, break a window or something like that is it really worth um, that amount of destruction i think that's a fair argument although i don't agree with the further argument of of police equal bad mm-hmm. um so in 1990 there was a famous uh, uh, uh verdict of the beating of rodney king yeah. by by a police officer um and uh it was sort of the precursor to a lot of what we hear today of 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 uh, police brutality and it started a riot when uh, the police officer was acquitted uh, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, 13,000 troops uh, from the California National Guard were sent in. There were 53 fatalities, 2,000 people injured, and $1 billion of damage. Um, by contrast, another way to have handled it um, is what San Diego did, which is just a little bit down the road. Um, and they knew that this was going to be an unpopular decision if 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 it went that way um so so they instead um instead of you know breaking heads and setting up these militarized police um they actually did a lot of work uh, talking with city leaders um with the civil civil rights leaders minority leaders um they set up a hotline to report police abuse um, against citizens um they persuaded a tv station to host a telethon this is the very 90s, right? Um, <laughs> uh, post a telethon in which uh, people were able to call in and have conversations with city leaders about this. And the Los Angeles Times credited those efforts with saving San Diego from the riots that Los Angeles dealt with in the fallout of the Rodney King um, court case. It's funny what so happens there, when you actually connect with your community. Yeah, you put in the work. It's the boring stuff. It's the putting in the it's you know the extra lighting. It's those are the things that go unsung a lot, but are actually make you a hero. So, Curtis, what is this down here about uh, asking us about the show phenomenon? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So I purposely took this out because I didn't want you to just look ahead in the notes and know the answer to this. Okay, so. Um, what show started in 1989 that was an absolute phenomenon that uh, furthered uh, the, the sort of perception of cops? And I have a clue uh, to, to, to give you that, that will, help, will hopefully help you get it. Okay, you ready? Ready. Okay. Huh! <laughs> I, I don't think I watch enough TV. <laughs> I, I am going to guess that it is the show Cops. Bad boys. What? Oh what God, you want, damn what you it! Want to do? <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. So yeah, so like there is nothing to me that's more indicative of of modern policing mm-hmm. and maybe more responsible than the show Cops. Yep. Um, hold on. 
So I took I took this out of the notes so nobody would get it. But now I have to like now now I have to read it from my notes. So uh, <laughs> so so the show Cops began in 1989 with an instant cultural and ratings hit. Um, it gained a reported 15 million viewers um, at first, and it wow. actually kept eight million viewers per episode uh, for many years. Uh, many people who were on the show that were arrested actually like signed the forms so that they could see that you could see their face because they saw it as a badge of honor to be on this cultural hit. Um, uh, in the show, in the making of the show, Cruz basically was tagged along with police. It was one of the first reality shows um, ever on the air. And it was at the time considered to be one of the most raw verite um, mm-hmm. shows that, that were on TV. There was no storyline. There was no, you know, there was no continuous characters. It was just tagging along with police and, and it was really popular. But after a time, people started noticing a lot of um, continuing themes, um, mm-hmm. which were, the, it was something like over 50% of the cases uh, that they were handling. So let me actually look it up. Um, uh, there was more. It was more cases. Hold on one second. Let me get to this part here. Um, so what what seemed to be unproduced was actually heavily produced. So oh yeah. For every for every one hundred minutes that were shot, they used one minute of that. Another n- another study conducted that same year concluded that the TV officers were far better solvers of crime than most, um, and. Uh, as, as measured in official government statistics and the show's portrayal of violent crime uh, were more of a caricature than reality. Mm-hmm. Rapes, robberies, mm-hmm. murders, and the like accounted for just 13% of all crime committed in the U S in 1994. Yet in the world of cops, it was 43%. Uh, the same study found that cops was far more likely to associate black and brown people than whites with violent crime, 40% um, versus 13% which was the reality. 13% was reality. 40% was what they showed it on cops. Mm -hmm. Um, While one of the country's most victimized demographic, young black men were usually underrepresented as the victim. Um, So, you know, the show actually went off in 2020. They are technically still filming for, for, uh, for other markets, I guess, um, which is what I just learned. Um, for I guess other markets still had a contract with them or something, so they're technically still filming. Um, during the run of their show, at least one of their crew members was shot and died. Oh wow! Uh, um, but outside of a robbery that was taking place, so it was a really dangerous show to work on. Um, but um, but it played this huge part in our perception of cops. And my understanding of it is, cops watched the show Cops to understand how to be cops and then the cops on the show cops wanted to be like other cops they saw on the program cops and acted like them so so like it's hard to know what came first but eventually there was a standard for what a cop did how they acted how they interacted with the people and unfortunately it was based on a reality tv show that Spoiler alert for all you people who love reality TV is not realistic in the least. So yeah, so Bill Clinton is elected in 1992. Uh, he was a former hippie who had smoked pot, but apparently didn't inhale, which was always like the lamest <laughs> thing I ever heard anyone say. <laughs> um, but a lot of people had hope that he would be softer on on drug users and marijuana users. Um, so, uh, that kind of went away pretty quickly because Clinton had a program called troops to cops, which subsidized police departments for hiring returning veterans, which sounded Mm -hmm. good. But if those people have PTSD and militarized training, they're going to act the way they acted in war on the streets of America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it plays into the whole continuing theme of militarization of the police force. Right. And, and it plays against this defense of it's just a few bad apples because if you were just randomizing the people who were there and you had a, you know, some bad incidents that happened, you could just say they're, they're bad apples. But if this, if the same thing keeps happening for the same reason, 
isms it's 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 you, you've skewed the the type of cop that is joining by literally rewarding police departments who hire that particular type and then you wonder you know why do they why do they start off with so so many you know so much ptsd like well you hired a veteran and that's great but maybe they should be doing something less stressful you know mm -hmm. maybe there should be a, a, a more of a screening that makes sure they're ready to demilitarize and join a non-military force that is the police and then oh and clinton did this thing i've heard this about this before too um he did this really crappy thing it was called one strike and you're out yeah um it basically if if any drug offense even a misdemeanor is committed in public housing that's supported by federal funding those people would be evicted mm -hmm. um even if the person who owned the house didn't know what was happening say a grandmother that is taking care of her grandchild because the grandchild's father is in jail so now the grandmother and the grandchild are out on the street because the grandchild smoked pot in in the bedroom or whatever something innocent not the big not the biggest deal has just ruined their lives i just i don't understand the lack of humanity in so many of these laws and whatnot like it just it seems like there's just such a lack of care and empathy for people it's because it's punishment first yeah right isn't that what we were told um in the episode about private prisons yeah, yeah it's not reform it's punish 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 it feels better to punish than mm -hmm. to help or to understand, you know, uh, to learn, to expand, um, to progress. It's much better to just hold your ground and say, well, it's your fault. You got tangled up in this law. I guess you shouldn't have done it. But that's not the point. Maybe the law shouldn't have been there to begin with. Mm hmm. Um, but yeah, and a real quick note, we're kind of wrapping up here the episode, but, but one thing I thought was interesting was, uh, in the nineties, Republicans were against raids for a while because, um, a lot of the raids were on, um, conservative groups, um, such as the raid on branch Davidian compound in Waco, uh, which were, is kind of like a libertarian, uh, hero group. Um, that, you know, were kind of their own like posse and refused to, to get off the land or whatever. Okay. <sighs> the Branch Davidians is its own entire, if you want to learn about the Branch of Davidians, watch the limited series Waco, which has its own issues and its representation of the, uh, um, oh, what is it? The tobacco and firearms, the TFA or whatever it is. Um, and the FBI, it has its own issues in its representation of those law enforcement officials. But watch Waco, and if you want a true, honest, detailed explanation of the Branch Davidians, as well as Ruby Ridge, listen to the Branch Davidians episode of last podcast on the left. Um, it will give you a perfect explanation as to what happened at... Uh, uh, during the siege in Waco with the Branch of Vinians, as well as Ruby Ridge, it is a it's it's an absolutely horrific use of force by the U.S. government. It is they they murdered seventy six people and burned men, women, and children alive. It's it's wow. it's absolutely horrific, and it, they came back out of it. Um, the FBI basically toted it as a huge success because Ruby Ridge was an absolute disaster. Um, and so once the Branch Davidians happened, it gave them a chance to say, hey, let's go in, guns are blazing, and we're going to be the heroes in the eyes of America. And, and it, Bill Clinton it, defended the government raids by the ATF as yeah. just upholding the law. It was an absolute disaster. Interesting. And then so we move on to 2001, Bush won the election, um, and then he started raiding marijuana clinics, which is just the lowest <laughs> thing you can do. I mean, there's people sick that are just trying to get, get some weed, and you're raiding them. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, George Bush. Um, but hey, our then, boy uh, Daryl Gates is apparently still around. What's what's he up to? What's he been up well, to? I think, well, we got we're we're kind of messing with time here a little bit. Like so, so Gates actually did resign in 1992. Really? Um, yeah. It, uh, the I believe it was the fallout from the Rodney King uh, riot that ended up happening. That was kind of it. Kind of did him in. By that point, though, he had already established SWAT teams. You know, had been responsible for SWAT teams um, establishing all over America. There's there's literally thousands of SWAT teams uh, all over America. Depend doesn't matter if your town has five thousand people or five million. You have a SWAT team almost for sure. Um, so his his lasting legacy is the SWAT teams. Um, but he did kind of have to resign in a little bit of um a mm-hmm. of, of, of you know negative uh press because of because of how that went so wrong well and i think right. this is a really important sentence you paraphrase from rise of the uh, warrior cop is um the rodney king verdict and the riots thereafter ended daryl gates's career by then swat teams across america numbered in the thousands most of them weren't responding to riots or black panther barricades or shootings most swat teams spent most of their time breaking down doors on drug raids swat didn't stop the rodney king riots only the national guard did yeah and and you know the thing that they're most supposed to be used for they 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 weren't appropriate for <laughs> you know so it, it was it was kind of like like it failed in its main purpose but also found another purpose it was very successful at but we would argue that it's not appropriate to be used that way um but yeah um gates died in 2010 um and uh swat teams are still yeah. going strong today and uh, that's kind of where today's episode kind of ends we're going to go back on a couple of things and expand on them a little bit more like no knock raids, um, stuff like that. But that's essentially the spark notes on the history of the police, why we created them and why we gave them power. And that now, what do we uh, do about it? brings us to the end of part two of our good cop, bad cop series. Uh, we do have one more part in this series coming up. Curtis, what are we going to be talking about in the next episode? Oh, it's really exciting. So so now that we have that primer of everything that led up to now, we're going to kind of uh, discuss where we're at now and and uh, and what we can do about it. We're going to we're going to take a a we're going to we're going to kind of create a archetypal cop. We're going to talk about typically what what, you know, what sex they are, what what uh you know how old they are how much education they get the pressure they get put under the you know the the the, how they get through academy uh what's required to pass the academy all these different things we're gonna build up an archetypal cop and then we're gonna take this archetypal cop and in a fictionalized way we're gonna make them break bad we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show the routes that that a lot of cops take that lead them down this bad apple road that is not just because they're just bad people, just like the drug pe- drug dealers are not just bad people. They're not just bad people, but there's actually a system that, you know, ignores bad cops, rewards bad cops over good cops sometimes, and um, perpetuates a system that if we don't do something about it, will never end. Kara, any final thoughts before we sign off? No, thanks, Curtis, for doing such great research. It's definitely an important topic, so I'm glad we're talking about it. All right, y'all. That will do it for today's episode. I'm happy you stuck around. I know this is a uh, a very heavy hitter that we're uh, jumping back into, but uh, I hope you've you've enjoyed (laughs) it. Um, If you want to get a hold of us, um, anything that uh, we missed out on in the episode or anything, uh, any questions that arose for you, uh, you can get a hold of us at PWB network at gmail.com. You can also check us out uh, on our website, get a hold of us there on uh, podcastwithoutborders.com. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, where I put all of our updates on our Facebook page, uh, Facebook forward slash uh, podcast without borders. Uh, yeah, get a hold of us if you have any questions, folks. Otherwise, stick around for part three of Good Cop, Bad Cop. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. 
Thank you for listening to Social Discord, part of the Podcast Without Borders Network. You can get a hold of us by sending us an email at pwbnetwork at gmail.com. You can also check out our website at podcastwithoutborders.com. Thanks for listening.